Hi everybody and welcome to How to Make Better Trading Decisions, a coaching perspective with myself, Steve Ward. Thanks for joining me this afternoon and uh, thanks to FX Street for inviting me to speak. I think we've got about 45 minutes on the on the schedule plus a bit of Q&A time. Obviously, I'm sure you can appreciate uh, decision making is a huge topic. There are hundreds of books of hundreds of pages each, of pages each and uh, we'll, we'll do our best to... Uh, to try and give you as much as we can in the next 45 minutes. But it will be a bit of a whistle-stop tour, so uh, keep your ears on, keep listening quickly, and, uh, and obviously at the end, if there's any questions, I'll take them then. I just had this, this little disclaimer. Obviously, a lot of my content isn't market-related, but uh, just to cover ourselves. So, quick disclaimer, the content of this webinar is the personal opinion of the presenter. The content does not constitute financial investment or tax advice. Any reference made to asset classes and trading examples are for illustration only. You advise to discuss your specific requirements with an independent financial advisor prior to entering into any trading or investment decision. By joining this webinar, you do so at your own will and in doing so waive liability to any claims against the host, presenter and any associated organisations and people. Okay, great. That's, uh, if you're all good with that, let's, uh, let's crack on. So just a, a quick intro. Thanks for a few of you who sent messages via the, uh, the message board there. Uh, a few familiar names and, and good to speak to you and, and work with you again for those of you who I already know. For those of you I don't know, my name is Steve Ward. I spend my days uh, working with traders and fund managers in the area of performance and psychology. In a distant past life, I was a sports and performance psychologist working with athletes and teams all over the globe, 33 different sports. And alongside that, really to pay the bills, did some corporate coaching, uh, leadership, management, high performance teams and peak performance. Until 2005, when I found myself randomly on a trading floor in London, uh, a big trading group there had the, the idea that maybe performance psychology might help uh, with trading performance. So we did some coaching, did some workshops. It went really well. They liked it. I liked it. And uh, since 2006, I've been full-time in the market, working with traders at investment banks, hedge funds, asset management, investment managers, energy companies, prop trading groups, but also... Probably a lot of people like yourselves, what we call the retail trader, guys trading from home, either part-time or full-time. So all across the spectrum, all different asset classes, all different abilities from the beginner right through to the 25 and 30 year seasoned market uh, veterans. So uh, hopefully I can bring to you today some, some ideas from my own coaching practice, from the people I've had the pleasure of working with over the last seven or eight years, and some of the research into decision making, behavioral finance, neuroscience, performance psychology and a bit of cognitive coaching as well so a real mixture um but uh you know i say i think the key thing is that i'd ask you to be doing is as we go through today's session just be thinking to yourself you know reflect on your own decision making reflect on your own trading uh, discipline review some of the content we're going through try and make sense of it as it fits into your model of the world and maybe beyond the session there'll be one or two ideas to take away that you can use to refine and improve your decision making. It's not my job to tell you uh, this is the only way of doing things, but I'll present some ideas, some theories, um, some strategies and techniques. Take on board what's useful for you, but keep an open mind and keep asking yourself, could this help me to make a better trading decision? So two people on the screen. So just a bit of an early quiz to see if you can name the two people. And if you can, if you can get the two names, feel free to type them in and we're going to have a look at, uh, at your trading knowledge. One should be slightly easier than the other. So on the right hand side, hopefully those of you uh, that are slightly more observant will notice it's uh, Tamsin Roberts, uh, Sky News presenter. But the, the interesting one of the two on the left hand side there, uh, some of you, uh, not Bill Gates, uh, but Jerome uh, Cavill, the stock gen trader who managed to lose 7.2 US billion dollars. Uh, labelled a rogue trader under the same heading as, as our friend Nick Leeson. Now, what's interesting is when we look at rogue traders as they get as they get kind of named in the media, what we're seeing basically are traders, normal, often normal people, normal, normal traders, who just happen to lose very large sums of money. That's why they make the news. And underpinning that, what's interesting for me is the behaviours that they exhibit that cause those losses are exactly the same behaviours they're the same decision-making errors as lots of other traders make. In fact, that the majority of traders make, and the primary difference is really only being the number of zeros at the end of that loss. 
And, you know, when you reflect on your own decision making, your own discipline, then maybe you can think about, you know, have you had times where you, for example, have run a loss? Because that's what Cavill done. That's what Nick Leeson did. You know, that's what these guys are doing. They're just running losses. They get to that point where the loss becomes so big, they physically, emotionally, mentally, financially can't afford to take it. Then you get into that land where you may be being yourself, hoping, wishing, praying, and that's a dangerous place to be. So, running losses, cutting profits at the other side of the, of the, of the equation. Overtrading, not trading, so seeing trades set up but not taking them, and excessive risk taking. All of these are decision based. So when we talk about trading discipline, we're ultimately looking at our trading decisions. And if we can improve our trading decisions, then we can improve our trading discipline. So that's what today is really all about. And, you know, I think something for you to be thinking about, you know, if you were making better trading decisions right now, if you were more disciplined right now, how would you know? What would you be doing differently if you were more disciplined, if your decision making was more effective? So kind of have that question in the back of your mind because that can help to target your attention onto some of the key points as we go through. Now, day to day I work as a coach and a trainer, so I'm client facing, I'm working face to face with traders all over the globe. And the, the key thing that's really important is, as a coach, I guess my success is measured on, did I help someone improve their performance? And hopefully, in the 40 odd minutes we've got left today, we can help you to improve your performance. Now, there are three key ways that I do that. First of all, I try and improve people's understanding. And there's, there's quite a lot of research been done that shows where people understand more about their decision making than purely by understanding more about decision making it actually helps you to reduce your decision making error and improve your decision making capabilities. There's some great research from a guy called Keith Stanovich at the University of Montreal. Secondly, a really key area, and we'll look at both of these today, is awareness of how you make decisions and the type of context and situations where you make better or worse decisions. And finally, the key part of improving decisions is what I call management. And this is where maybe we can utilize some practical tools or techniques to improve our decision making to become more disciplined. And during the course of this webinar, we'll try and cover all three. But obviously, do bear in mind that, you know, this is a big topic. Each of these could be, you know, an area on its own. And we'll cover them as best as we can. But really, I want to try and give you some food for thought, give you some techniques and ideas so you can go away and try for yourself beyond the webinar. Let's have a look at understanding. Now, when we come to understand decision making and discipline, there are three key things that we really need to understand. The first one is, which is fundamental, which is what is a good trading decision? We then need to understand how we actually make trading decisions. And then we need to look at the factors that affect our trading decisions. So let's have a look at this. So what is a good trading decision? So do we evaluate the quality of our trading decisions based on the process by which we made the decision or by the outcome, the win or the loss? So what are your thoughts on that, folks? So when you look at a trading decision, when you say to yourself, have I made a good decision? How are you evaluating that? Is it on process or is it on the outcome, whether you won or lost? Okay, great. So looking at the, those of you there who've, uh, who've typed in, we kind of get a mixture of process for some, some of you saying both, and uh, which is great. Some of you, so the result, what's interesting is I've just done a, a two and a half week tour of, of funds over, over Asia. We did about 60 different funds over the two and a half weeks. And I would generally say that the bias was towards outcome. That when people tend to look at um, the decision, an investment or trading decision, how would we judge if it's good or bad? The tendency, certainly from my experience, is by outcome. It's great you guys are saying process because that is, in a way, the correct answer. That's how we want to be judging our decisions is based on the process. Obviously, the danger of an outcome is that, A, outcomes are largely out of our control, so we can have good process and luck, randomness, outside events, call them what you will, can interfere and change our change our actual um, our, our outcomes. And... The only thing we can control is the process. So, you know, an outcome's out of our control. So if we want to improve our decision making, if we want to improve our trading, just thinking about the outcome doesn't get us anywhere. But when we start to look at our process, and the key thing is to be curious about your process. And as you're saying there, you guys, be curious about the process and how it affects your outcome. So the two together 
that's when it becomes interesting. And certainly in my experience in sport and in trading and in business and work with the military, it's curiosity, a fascination with process, the process of excellence underpins high performance. So we want to be curious about our process and the outcomes they're getting. But generally, people have an outcome bias. So for those of us who are focused on the outcome, we need to focus on the process. For those of you guys already doing uh, focus on the process, that's great uh, and stick with it because that is the way forward. So we can start to look at trading decisions in this kind of little matrix here. So good process, poor process. We could say disciplined or not disciplined, for example. We can win or lose. So out of the four quadrants there, again, a question for you guys to think about which is the best possible outcome? One, two, three or four. Okay, great. So we've got a pretty good consensus there that, that, that one is the is the best one. Now, what's the second best outcome? So the second best outcome, is it two, three or four? Okay, and again, the, the general consensus there, probably the majority of you going for two, a few people on, on a three. And my, my guessing behind your, your reasoning is, a two is good because you stuck with your process. Uh, if you've gone for a three, obviously you've been attracted by the outcome. Uh, even if the process was poor, we still made money. Now, what's interesting is um, there's, a, there's a, a, a book called Winning Decisions by two guys called Russo and Schumacher. And uh, it's a great book, but they have a similar sort of grid. It looks more like this, though. Uh, good process, poor process, win, loss. And instead of one, two, three, four, they have different terms. So a good process and a win, which we all agreed was our, you know, our kind of primary outcome. They called that a deserved success. A good process which loses, they called that a bad break. And that actually is the second best outcome because the key thing is we did good process, which is important. We were disciplined. And when you're trading any kind of strategy, you're going to get some wins. You're going to get some losses. It's, it's probabilistic. And those losses will be controlled risk managed losses. Poor process and the win, the old quadrant three, they called that dumb luck. It's a bit like the blackjack player. He's sitting at the table. He gets dealt 18. Statistically, you should keep those cards. Maybe he hasn't won for a while. Maybe he's feeling a bit lucky. Maybe he's had too much to drink. He decides to take a card. Let's assume he gets a three. He's got the 21. He feels great. He beats the dealer. He wins all the chips. Feels great. The outcome's good. But if he repeats the process over time, then obviously it won't work in his favour. So process is key. Uh, so the question there, why have a good process if you keep losing? If you keep losing, then it's likely the process isn't good. So uh, when you come to evaluate your trading, and evaluation is key in trading, we'll come to that in a moment. If you're continually losing, then uh, you know, you'd want to be looking at, is my process right? So that's why looking at process and outcome together is important. Outcome alone, not enough, and process alone, not enough. The two together is, is what's key. And then the final one, and this is where Cavill and Leeson kind of ended up, and other traders who perhaps you've never heard about but lost large sums of money, poor process with a loss, poetic justice. And you got what you deserved. The more we stay in poor process, the more of those dumb luck trades we get. It's a bit like being a naughty child and getting extra pocket money. It reinforces the negative behavior. And eventually, if we stay in poor process, when it starts to go horribly wrong, it goes horribly, horribly wrong. And they're the trades that basically that I've seen many traders in all different areas, retail, institutional, investment bank, prop group. They're the ones where, you know, they, they are the bad news trades. So but they often come as a result of having been in that poor process and getting lucky a few times. And then when it goes horribly wrong, that is the bad news trade. So the more we can stay on that top row, and this is the secret really, staying on the top row is our key. So how do we actually make a decision? Well, the important thing to recognize, and this is quite a simplistic model, but it works really well for trading financial markets, is there's four key stages. The first one is observation. So you're sitting there, you're watching your screens, maybe you've got some news on the TV, or you've got your squawk box on. Maybe you've got emails that are coming through from brokers with reports, maybe you've got stock reports, newspapers, but you've got all this information around you. Now, what the key thing to recognize is that you don't make a decision based on that information, but you make a decision based on your orientation 
of that information, which I'm sure we're all aware of. Yeah? So we filter that information, we make sense of it, that comes to a decision, which then leads to action. Now, the orientation phase is the interesting phase in decision-making because it's what goes on there largely determines whether the decision is a good one or not. And there are a number of factors which occur in there, and this is a few of them. So when you're looking at information, how you make sense of that information is dependent on your skills, your knowledge, your trading strategy, so your parameters, whether you're technical or fundamentals, which indicators you use. It's dependent on how you're feeling, your mood and emotion. There are cognitive biases and shortcuts, your thoughts, your beliefs, assumptions, behaviours, habits you've got, past experience, recent experience. All of these factors are filtering that observation down and into a decision. And what's really important, I guess, to be aware of is that a lot of that goes on outside of conscious awareness. So we're not consciously thinking through all these factors. It's just happening. So when we start to look at our decisions we're making and we evaluate our trading performance, we should be a little bit curious about what's going on inside our heads that's enabling us to make these decisions because that's where the decision-making center is, right there in the brain, prefrontal cortex, just behind your forehead. That's our decision-making center. Now, we could talk about all these areas in great depth. We haven't got time today, but I just want you to be aware of the fact, you know, that orientation phase is key and certainly things like your belief you know, your kind of mental map around how you view the market is a key factor. Emotion is a key factor. And also biases, cognitive biases and shortcuts. And some of you may be familiar with behavioral finance. Uh, and if you're not, it's something worthwhile having a bit of a look at because it's the study of financial decision making under risk and uncertainty particularly. And what they show is basically the brain is hardwired in particular ways, which are great for survival, great for kind of general life and getting through life generally. But when it comes to us being in the financial market, a lot of the ways that we're hardwired are not that useful for actually making money in, in trading. And, and we'll just do one very quick example because it's a, it's a really relevant one. It's called the disposition effect and it works like this. So imagine I've just given you a thousand dollars and now I give you two options. Option A, you're guaranteed an additional five hundred dollars. So you're now fifteen hundred dollars guaranteed. Or option B, we can flip a coin. If it's heads, you win another thousand dollars, so you'd have two thousand dollars. If it's tails, you get nothing more. Which would you choose, A or B? Okay, so 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 thanks for your responses and, and the majority they're going for an A, a couple of B's in there. Some people who are saying hey, you wish they could say B but are saying A. Um you've got to go with you know, you've got to be honest. Imagine you have that money there in your hand right now and try and do it as realistically as possible, because it's a good insight into our thinking. Now how about this situation? Now imagine, imagine it's another day, give you two thousand dollars this time. You're required to choose again between two options. This time option A, I give you two thousand dollars. If you go for A you're guaranteed to lose 500, so you get your $1,500. But option B, we give you the chance again to flip a coin. If it's heads, you're going to lose $1,000, so you go down to $1,000. But if it's tails, you lose nothing. You keep the full $2,000. Which option would you choose, A or B? Okay, so we've probably got uh, a mixture of, of A's and B's. Uh, we're not gambling. They are, well, I guess they're kind of gambling-based questions. They're actually risk-based questions. It's about risk and reward, which is what trading is about. And here's what's really interesting is in the first um, example there, the majority of people do go for A. About 78% of people go for option A in, in the general population. I.e., in a situation of gain, people are risk-averse. In the second example, we are kind of probably about a 50-50 mix. But again, in the normal population, the majority of people actually go for option B. Again, around about the 80% type mark go for option B. They become risk-seeking in a situation of loss. Now, if we think about this in pure trading terms, think about the golden rule, run your profits, cut your losses. What this is suggesting is that people might have a predisposition, 
it's a dispossession effect, which is in a situation of gain to become risk averse, i.e. actually, as we're making money, our tendency in the majority of people is going to be to want to actually cut those profits, whilst in a situation of loss, the natural tendency in the majority of people is going to be to become risk seeking, i.e. we're going to be more willing to run our losses in that situation. And, and that's just an example. There are many more of these, but I think it just highlights the fact that there are within us, there are hardwired effects, there are, there are tendencies which may be affecting our trading, which actually are counter to how we want to be behaving. And that's why, you know, a lot of people talk about the best traders think differently. Um, it is about having a different mindset. It's about viewing trading differently and behaving differently to get the best outcome. Uh, and this is, a, this is a great quote, which kind of sums up how the brain makes decisions. From, uh, from a, it's a good book, actually. You're in your brain. If you've not read it, I'd highly recommend it. Jason Zweig. Um, the brain seeks to make decisions in the easiest way possible with the least possible emotional cost and the least mental effort. It's called cognitive ease. The brain's lazy. Wherever it can, it will take shortcuts. And it particularly likes to take shortcuts where there's stress or pressure, where time frames are short, or where there's uncertainty. Now, think about trading. There's often a bit of pressure. We can often be trading under short time frames. And we've got uncertainty and ambiguity in large amounts of the time. You know, it's part of the game. So the trading environment kind of it sucks the brain in to making these quicker, shortcut-based decisions. And if you like trading very short time frames and, you know, volatile-type markets, then that is a, a typical scenario where the brain really gets kind of sucked into working what they call System 1, very intuitive, instinctive, quick, clean, often called the dirty system, very raw. Um, so, again, a, a big topic, behavioral finance, again, books of hundreds of pages. If you want to find out more, Your Money in Your Brain is a great book. There's a good book called Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, which just came out recently, and also a book called, a bit more of a thicker book, if you like a, a book stroke doorstop, uh, Behavioral Investing, by James Montier. So, but worthwhile having a little bit of a read. There's great stuff on the net as well. Just to become familiar with some of the kind of the basic traps that you might fall into because it can help you to understand why you're doing what you're doing. Um, someone to put their back, can you type the books into the chat? I, I will do, um, perhaps at the end, if you remind me, and I'll put them into the chat there at the end. Um, I'm, I'm a pretty simple fellow and, and, uh, and not a great multitasker, so just uh, managing to talk and, and look at the slides is probably a challenge enough for me at the moment, so without typing as well. So if you can remind me at the end, I'll more than happily do that uh, when we get to the end there. So let's have a look at awareness. And, and awareness is interesting because if you've ever read a self-help book, and, and don't be afraid to admit it if you have, most people have nowadays, it's not the stigma it used to be, then you would have heard the phrase, um, you must be more self-aware. It happens all the time. And awareness is key, but the question is, how do we get awareness? That's what's really important. So I'm going to share with you three ways of improving your awareness around your decision-making to help you to improve decision-making. Yep, so um, so uh, probability of ruin, gambler's fallacy, trading fishing, yep, all, all absolutely, definitely read up on those, all part of the behavioral finance work, so... Uh, thanks for sharing that. So the awareness advantage, three things we can do, reflective awareness, performance awareness, and situational awareness. Now, I'll quickly run you through all three. Some of these you may be doing already, some may be newer, um, but certainly in my own coaching work, I use these three all the time. Very, very important. Uh, and certainly, again, from sport, from business, from my trading, from the investing work I do, people with high levels of awareness generally do perform better, you know, to a high level of their capability. So it's certainly something to be thinking about. Reflective awareness is very straightforward. Uh, you know, it's the old thing. You'll have heard this a million times before. It's about journaling. It's about keeping record and reflecting on that. And things that are important are, you know, when you make a trading decision, you need to note down what is the decision. You know, the market I've traded, how many contracts or pounds per point have I traded it for? Long, short, um, the reasons why I traded, so, you know, what did I get in the market for? What was my rationale behind it? What's my reasoning? Is it, you know, what indicators have I seen? Or what, what was my kind of fundamental view? Why this trade? Why at this time? Also, your expectations. What do you expect to happen? And as part of that, where do you expect to get out? You know, where's your exit going to be? And then the fourth one, which is not done by many people, which I think is really valuable, is what we call noteworthy observation. And this could be 
uh, a particular mood you've got or um, a feel you've got at the time. It could be a thought that's maybe in your mind. It could be distraction from maybe home life or from work life. It could be particular market conditions. Maybe it's high volatility or maybe the market's really quiet. Maybe the market shifted and changed a little bit. But just things outside the norm that might be worthwhile noting down. And they're the kind of things that should be in that journal. And um, the key thing about journals is, um, I guess, they're not hard to keep, but what is hard is actually remembering to keep them. But they are massively valuable. And I see it in my, in definitely I could say with my hand on my heart, that where the traders I coach use journals, and they haven't got to be huge, but, you know, simple, effective journals, it does make a difference. It focuses your attention. It makes you more aware. You see the patterns in your thinking, the patterns in your feeling, the patterns in your decisions, the good ones, the not so good ones. And it enables you to take that and work with it. You know, in sports psychology, every good athlete has got a training diary. And that, that's the kind of analogy I would use. It's critical data. Now, when you keep it in a journal, there are three things we need to know. And I'll give you what the first one is, and then we'll see if you can work out the, the next two. So the first one is, we want to be looking to what happened to the trades that we took. Now, there are two other things that we need to know if you want to really get a sense as to how good our decision making is. So what would the other two factors be? So the first one, what happened to our trades that we took? What else do we need to know? Okay, so we followed our process. That's a good one. It's not on this three here, but that, but that is absolutely true. We do want to be looking at that. Patterns, again, good. Yet why? All good. How we feel about it. Yeah, these are all good and these are all valid. Good. So someone said there's a fate of the trades we did not take, which is good. And then also what happened to the trades after we got out. Yeah. So in terms of trying to look at our decision-making process and how good that is, our power of a prediction, for example, we need to know not just what happened to the trades that we actually took, but also what happened after we got out, because that lets us know if we got out too early or too late, and also what happened to the trades that maybe we thought about taking but didn't, because that's also valuable information. And that doesn't mean that the journal or the log becomes a little bit bigger, but it also means it has massive amounts of value. So reflective awareness. Once we start to reflect and get a sense of our decision-making process, then we can start to get what we call performance awareness. Now, this is simply the um, an awareness of the difference between when your decision making is better and when it is worse. Uh, just a question is: So, do you journalise trades that you could have taken but missed or did not trade? That would be certainly useful to put in there. Yeah, absolutely. So, performance awareness. It's about thinking about your best trading decisions. Maybe think about one yourself now, a good trading decision you've made. Then think about one of your worst trading decisions. And, and, and they're simply categorized by probably the phrase, you know, why did I do that? Uh, that's what you're trying to put, you know, that's going to be a useful pointer in the, in the right direction. And then it's a case of comparing and contrasting between the two, you know, and looking at what do I notice? What's the difference between my better decisions and the ones that aren't as good? And the way that I would get my clients to look at this in terms of um, trying to map it out is, what were you thinking when you made your best decisions and what's your thinking like on your worst decisions? Is there anything different? What about emotionally? What about behaviourally in terms of how you act? And also what about physiology, heart rate, breathing, muscle tension? And also critical, outside of you, is the context. Is the difference between your best decisions and your worst ones is it about the context? It could be um, work-life type stresses or situations. It could be about time frame. It could be based on the capital you've got, you know. Better decisions when you've got more capital. Worse decisions when you've got less capital. Better decisions when you've got more time and you're more relaxed. Worse decisions when maybe you're more rushed, you know, rushing in from work maybe, straight into the screen, not prepared and so on. So thinking about it from those um, different five different areas is really valuable. To start to look at what's the process of a good decision, versus a bad one, again, to give you some insight into what can I do to make better decisions more of the time. Always remembering, and this is critical for traders to remember, underpinning all of our performance is us, a human being, and we're all fallible. So we're not going to get it right all the time. There's that great book about golf called Golf is Not a Game of Perfect, and it's exactly the same for trading. Yeah, we're fallible humans. We want to try and be 
as good as we can most of the time, and that's probably the best we can hope for. Now, the third level of awareness is what I call situational awareness. And this is a really key one because it's the ability in the moment, so in the moment to be aware of, am I in the hub, am I transitioning, or at the rim? Now, the hub is you at your best. So, again, when you're at your best, there are particular thoughts, feelings, physiology, behaviours, and maybe even context. There are things that help you to be in that hub. And then when you're at your worst, you're out towards the rim. And again, there'll be context, there'll be thoughts and feelings and physiology, which will help you, which will put you at the rim. But it's not binary, hub or rim. There's that transitionary phase in between. And a really good skill to develop while you're trading is the ability to notice, am I towards the hub? Let's call that a 10 out of 10. It's right bang in the center there. Or am I moving out towards the rim, right on the outside, a 1 out of 10. Where am I? on that scale. And how do you begin to become aware of that is you need to be aware of your thinking and your feeling and your emotions and your behavior and your physiology and context around you. So this is where self-awareness is critical because as you move towards the hub, the risk of making a decision-making error or being ill-disciplined reduces. Doesn't mean you won't have a losing trade, but you'll just be more disciplined. And as you move out towards the rim, the risk of decision-making error, of making mistakes, of, of kind of coming down into those sort of lower quadrant type trades increases. And so this is where you've got to start thinking about, you know, when I move out towards the rim, should I be trading? If I am trading, do I need to reduce my size? And this concept is what I call behavioral risk management. Risk management isn't just about having financial positions on and then managing them, because there's times when that risk should never be on in the first place, because you can manage your behavior up front or manage your size. So, Situational awareness is really key, and a good exercise is, when you go away from today's webinar, take some time and think about, when I'm in the hub, when things are going well for me, what's that like, and what helps me to be in the hub? When things aren't going well for me, when I'm at my worst, what's that like, and what helps me to be there? And then, once you've got the awareness of those two, so kind of the, the performance awareness, then the transition in the awareness becomes much easier. Combined with something really important, which I'm quite excited about, is this concept of mindfulness, the ability to Notice your awareness to be in the present right now, non-judgmentally, a bit like an impartial spectator, watching your experience and noticing where you're at. And mindfulness is interesting because over recent years, it's become a hotspot for neuroscientists. They love it. They love this concept of, of, of mindfulness. They're really into researching it. And originally, it started off kind of in sort of meditation type circles. It then moved into medicine. A guy called John Cabot in in the US did a lot of work with anxiety and depression and stress using mindfulness-based training. But now it's used in leadership. It's used in sports performance. It's been used by the US Marines uh, as part of their combat preparation. So it's become a really mainstream. And the reason for it is because there's lots of benefits. And this is just a few of them on the screen there of people who are more mindful. So increased executive function, which is kind of decision-making center much more aware of unconscious processes, greater cognitive control, shaping behavior, information perception is better, flexible in their responses, switching attention, sustaining attention. All of these are really, really key skills in trading. And in fact, on the, the tour we've just done of Asia, one of the key parts of the, of the program we did out there with the fund was about mindfulness-based training in terms of improving decision-making. So again, it's a topic all of its own, but there's plenty of stuff out on the internet there. There's some good books around, a good book called Mindfulness by Mark Williams. Um, but it's certainly something that I've used a lot with my clients. Uh, I'm using more and more with them um, because I think there's so many benefits that help traders, not just in terms of even just cognitive function, but also emotional control. And one of the key things we notice in people who are more mindful is they have lower levels of cortisol, the stress hormone. Um, their stress capacity kind of increases, and that's really important in emotional control which is really important in discipline and decision-making because emotions, where they start to move away from our normal range into more kind of disturbed emotional states, they're the ones that interfere with our trading decisions. So there's massive benefits in mindfulness. And, you know, I'd really urge you to kind of check it out. And if you come into the conference in Barcelona, it's going to be something I'm going to be talking about there because I think it's got a lot of value for traders. Now, let's just finish off and look at five different ways, so five different approaches some sort of practical technique that we can use to improve decision making. Now, the first one, and we've kind of touched on this already, but it's really important, is to focus on your trading process. 
Now, what that means is you have to know what your trading process is. So you can't focus on a process if you don't know what it is. So at some point, you've got to be aware, what is my trading process? So um, five key stages are important to me, in, I guess, in the, in the trading process. Observation of the market, spotting opportunities, entering trades, managing trades, and exiting trades. And at each stage of that model, there are important things to focus on. And one of the key things that definitely wants to be in your awareness is one of the biggest causes of underperformance in, in, in most areas, whether it's sport, whether it's public speaking, whether it's performing arts, whether it's business, whether it's uh, the military, whether it's in trading and investing, is where people start to overly focus on an outcome when they should be in process. So once you start to get into entering a trade, managing your trade, and exiting the trade, you want to be in your process, paying attention to what's important, asking yourself valuable questions, but not being overly consumed by the outcome because over focus on outcome creates performance anxiety. And uh, I had a, a really good trade I worked with last year and um, at the beginning of the year, he was an investment bank trader and they get their P&L reset to zero at, in January and he found it highly stressful kind of working from zero trying to build an account. And it's because he was so worried about losing money going negative from that zero point to the point where actually it manifested itself in an eye twitch. So we really got him to focus on process over a period of months, kind of did some techniques, working on process, doing some journaling, all about decision making and process, what's controllable, uh, to the extent where for the first time in six years, this year, he managed to start January, uh, most importantly without an eye twitch, and, and secondly, which obviously is a nicer part of the story as well, is making money pretty much straight from the start of the year in very difficult market conditions. But it's all about just kind of getting into that process. Um, the Mark Williams books, you saw the question there. Mind, I'm pretty sure it's just called Mindfulness uh, by Mark Williams, but it's the only one he's written. So if you, if you Google it or Yahoo it, then um, you will find it through there. So focus on process, really key. Secondly, less can be more. One of the things I've seen, particularly with a lot of guys trading at home is, they tend to do a lot of courses, which is great. They're very keen to improve. And there comes a point where they've kind of done nearly all the courses, read all the books, and you get the information overload. And I worked with a guy, uh, a retail trader, um, must have been early this year, late last year, early this year. And one of the key things I noticed was he had all these pages of checklists and indicators. And it, it basically became so complicated that he was ill-disciplined because he didn't really know what the strategy was. It was so complex. And uh, and I think for a lot of people, you can probably trim and simplify what you're doing down. Uh, and, and in many cases, actually, it's more useful. And, and certainly one of the insights I can share with you is, and I've been lucky I've worked with some of the you know, top traders um, across continents, across the world, and a lot of what they do is actually pretty simplistic. Uh, it's not overly complicated a lot of the time, whether they're doing discretionary type strategies. And... Because of that, they can be consistent with it. And they did some great research where they actually gave people five bits of information to make a decision. Then they gave them 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, and so on. And what they found was, as they gave them more information, their confidence in the decision improved, but accuracy decreased. So at some point, we have to recognize there's a payoff between you know, the number of indicators we've got and how complex the strategy is, and not just the accuracy, but actually how easy it is to actually trade it and make a decision in real time. So, so it's something to be mindful of, something to be aware of. Um, and if, if your stuff you've got already is pretty simple anyway, that's great. But, but I, I do see this tendency in people to kind of have lots of different strategies, all very complicated. And, and that doesn't help you to make decisions um, when you've got kind of information overload. So the third one, which, which I guess kind of ties into one and two, is it can be very useful to use checklists. There's a great book called Checklist Manifesto, which some of you may have read by Atul Gawanda. And he's a Harvard surgeon, and he talks about how they noticed it in, in the US that there's, you know, there's quite a large amount of mistakes being made in surgery and critical care, far more than we would like to, uh, you know, to know about, really. Uh, and they look at a way of, of reducing it. And what they come up with, you know, not sexy, uh, not cutting edge, uh, but, but, but it was checklists pre-surgery, during surgery, and post-surgery. And they implement the checklist and it has a reduction in errors by, I think it's around about 35, 36%. So significant just through checklists. And the idea being, you know, sometimes it's easy just to overlook things where maybe, you know, markets are moving faster or you're under a bit more stress or time pressure. Or even sometimes where you've began to automate something 
and you know it kind of becomes natural we can often miss out the little thing here and there and it can just give you some consistency and that checklist might be some key tasks to do but it could also be questions as well uh, good question here so does comfort in what you do increase your consistency of following your system it certainly helps uh, if you feel comfortable and I would say comfortable for me is about uh, probably underpinning that is trusting it uh, and one of one of my great friends who's a phenomenal trader he talks a lot about you've got to kind of really trust yourself to follow your strategy but then you've got to trust your strategy in the first place as well so you've got to kind of have a, have some kind of sense that you've got some kind of edge or advantage uh, that works in, in the, you know in, in the longer run and um, so that's, that's a really key thing Fourthly, managing risk. Why is this important? Two reasons why it's important. One, I see so many people who are trading way too big for the account size they've got, trying to you know make you know huge returns on small accounts. But the key thing is that the size of the risk you take, and there's kind of a, there's a personal part to this, there's a perception, but certainly as you take bigger risk, you're far more likely to create more anxiety around losing. Um, so often, kind of the um, the more negative emotion, stress, anxiety, and worry tend to increase as sizing increases as well. And I talk about sizing there in terms of if you're increasing your size, um, but without your account size growing at the same time. So, you know, a lot of people trading very big size and they've got big risk on, they're worried about the losses because of that. And, and they're cutting profits on the flip side to try and take, take money when they can. And, and, and so many people I work with, you can be more disciplined and make better decisions just by trading, you know, smaller size. And the final one, which is really key, is what I call self-regulation. And this is key because a lot of ill-discipline and a lot of bad decisions come around um, the area of kind of, you know, emotions. Now, interestingly, I I emotions, the kind of the view on emotion and decision-making has changed over the years. So in 2006, I was having a great conversation with a professor of finance in London, and he's talking to me about decision-making, and what he said to me is um, the two things. One, the future of trading is all automated. There's going to be no need for, hu for human traders beyond about 2008. Uh, and secondly, off the back of that, um, because of that, you'll probably want to have a look for a new job because there'll be no more clients for you to work with. So, and it's interesting because there was kind of a bit of a rise of the machines, black boxes, algorithmic trading. But interestingly, during, during 2008, during, during the, uh, the financial crisis, having been on trading floors in some of the banks, they were being told to switch off the black boxes. They were the ones that were losing the money, let the humans come in, use instinct, use intuition, be creative, and try and manage the trading you know, from, from a human side. Which then, uh, about four weeks ago, I was up, flying up to Scotland, do some work up there, read uh, um, some work by a guy called Sam, uh, Sam Wong at Princeton. He's a professor of neuroscience. And I'm reading his, his stuff, and he says um, two things that are really interesting. One, is emotion is critical to decision making but you have to harness the right emotion and be aware of emotions moving towards an extreme anger stress frustration worry sadness um, extreme happiness extreme confidence they're the ones where the risk increases so again think about the hub in the hub harnessing the right emotions as we move out towards the rim we start to move towards those more extreme type emotions we need to be aware of that situational awareness but he also says which kind of gave me a bit of a chuckle that the downside of automated trading machines is a lack of emotion. And then now, actually, in the US, there are people trying to program emotion into black box trading systems to make them more effective. It's called affective, AWS, affective programming. So emotions are a key factor in decision making. We can't make complex decisions without emotion, but we need to harness the right emotion. So what can we do? Lots of things affect emotions, but things like, you know, your level of competence is going to affect how anxious or confident you feel. So keep developing your competence. Uh, experience has a big factor. They did some great research, I think it was about 2007, where they looked at FX traders in an investment bank, and they measured their kind of physiology, the heart rate, breathing, how sweaty they were, doing quite volatile trading. And um, basically, the traders who were more experienced had less of a physiological response than those who were, uh, sorry, who were more experienced had less of a response than those who are less experienced. So experience is a factor. Preparation is key, you know, be prepared, be ready. That's a real key factor as well. Manage your risk is a really key factor like we've talked about. So there are some tangible things you can do to manage emotion. You can also 
the mindfulness-based practice, if you want to kind of have a look at that, again, has a big impact on emotional management, emotional awareness, reduction in, the, in cortisol um, as well, which is great. Uh, simple breathing techniques are kind of in the moment. Simple breathing techniques can be really useful. It's a great technique they use in the special forces. Uh, it's kind of got a centering breath. We use it a lot in sport, and it goes like this. 15 second breath and you can do one, two, three or four in a row is normally enough. You breathe in for six seconds and basically the idea is you kind of fill up the air from the diaphragm up through the lungs all the way up and then two seconds you hold the breath for, you let the oxygen flood around into the muscles and key for us into the brain and then a seven second long out breath. That's the body's natural relaxation response. So it's got a centering breath. So in this kind of key moments where you're kind of you want to kind of center yourself, get your emotions back under control. One, two, three, maybe four of those breaths will do the job. So, you know, sometimes you've got a position on, you get to that stage where you start to get the urge to get out of the position. There's no good reason to. It's purely a thought and anxiety. You can use your centering breath then and reassess. Do a couple, reassess. When it comes to that point when you've got to exit your trade, you get in towards your stop. You don't want to take the stop, but, you know, you've got to take it. You want that brain to be kind of switched on. Do the centering breath. Because what happens is, as you get under stress and pressure, blood flow is reduced away from the smart brain in the prefrontal cortex, and it goes into the limbic system, the emotional brain. So as you become more stressed and anxious and worried or angry and frustrated, at the time when you need to be most disciplined and rational, blood flow is being reduced from that area. So that's why the breathing is really key. So yeah, so snipers can slow down their pulse rate, absolutely. Because again, same for target shooters, same for people doing archery. Uh, it's about managing your state, bringing yourself right down, getting the brain switched on, being calm, being focused, being composed. So, so centering breath is really, it's a good one. Um, the, um, we do a lot of work in biofeedback, so kind of training traders to, to manage their state, looking at um, kind of their emotional state in kind of graphs and, and numbers on, on the screen and, and actually practicing managing their emotion, mainly using breathing techniques, it's the same kind of thing, but using breathing techniques or changing posture and physiology. Sometimes just getting up and having a walk around can get you out a little bit as well, um, but all really important. What we have to remember with the emotions is, and it, it's, a, it's a nice little reminder, is that your problem trading behaviours will exist in your problem trading state, and your best trading behaviours will exist in your best trading state. So what we want to try and do is, is to manage our state to enable our best behaviours. Again, emotions are a massive topic, but hopefully it's giving you a couple of little insights, a couple of things to think about uh, for beyond the webinar. And, and really just to kind of start wrapping up, because I noticed time has flown by as usual. Um, just take some time maybe, you know, think about, you know, from what we've talked about, what could you do that could help you to make better or more disciplined decisions? If you've got one or two things that you thought, yep, that sounds interesting or that would work for me, then the key thing is to take action on them. You know, so, so what will you do? When are you going to do it? Uh, you know, and what's the benefit going to be? That's the key thing, because underlying a kind of an action, you know, uh, a change is going to be a motivation. So what's the benefit going to be? And, and also just be thinking about, um, you know, remembering that, that, that the research in neuroscience is now showing that willpower is a finite resource. So, you know, it's better to focus on just one or two things than trying to do too many. So that's it for me on, on today's topic. I'm happy to take some questions. Uh, I'm happy to do some typing in as well now that I kind of uh, I can focus on the other side, the other screen over here as well. And um, if you want to find out any more uh, about what we do, the, uh, FX Street have got a little microsite on there, so you can have a look on there and, and find out more about things that we do. But uh, I'd like to spend really the next sort of few minutes just taking some questions from you guys if you've got any. If you want to find out more on um, from the site, you can look on the FX Street microsite there, or, or on the flip side, you're, you're more than welcome to have a look at uh, on our own website there. We've got some resources and bits and pieces, so uh, there's some video on there and some articles, so, so feel free to take a look on there as well. And I see there, Vicky just put up the, uh, the page there for the Traders Conference. Well, I'm 
looking forward to coming along and doing a talk there. I think I've got an hour talk and then some coaching as well, which will be really exciting. There's some real-time live coaching. Uh, so I've just noticed a question in here. So how to overcome the hesitation to take trades, which is which is an interesting one because hesitation uh, to take trades can happen for many different reasons. And, and one of the challenges I guess I have when I do these webinars and presentations is it, there's not just going to be one solution for, for each person because there could be an underlying reason that's different for everybody. So hesitation can be, sometimes be a personality trait around perfectionism. So we're kind of looking for all the information, all the lights to go on before we take it. Hesitation can also come because maybe there's been a past loss or a series of losses. So it's about overcoming those losses. So it, it largely depends on what the underlying challenge is. And, and in my coaching, that's probably what I've got to try and discover, I guess, with people. Um, but if you are getting hesitation, the first thing to ask yourself is, you know, what is it that's causing the hesitation? So what's kind of underlying that? You know, what, what might be the reason be, am I, do I always hesitate? I.e., is this a continual problem? Or is it situational? Is it, is it happening to me just now because of maybe what just happened or because of a situation I'm in, you know, that's kind of just recent? Uh, so that's kind of the key differentiator. What I would then do, I mean, these are some general techniques, though. Things you can do is use um, mental rehearsals, kind of like visualization type techniques where we get people to imagine seeing their setup. Maybe they feel some discomfort. We get them to experience that, but take the trade anyway. We might get them to reduce their trading size to kind of reduce the fear of, of loss. And the aim is just to kind of take the trade. We want to kind of get the habit again of taking the trade. It's not about making money or losing money. It's just about getting back in the habit of taking the trade. So smaller size combined with mental rehearsal, visualization would probably be the starting point without knowing too much more about kind of, you know, what the underlying was, as I said. Um, just trying to find now. You guys have suddenly piled in a load of questions here, so uh, let me just have a look. Uh, what are some of the ways uh, you can handle stress in drawdown? So again, that's an interesting one. Again, all one of the things about drawdown is, uh, again, the level of stress depends on different people, but also on how the drawdown occurred, i.e., is it a drawdown that's occurred over a series of smaller losses over time? Or has it come quite quickly? Because that can impact it. Um, but one thing about drawdown is you're kind of looking at you know, stress and resilience. So some key factors that are important are um, being proactive. So one of the worst things you can do when you're in drawdown is, is, is develop what they call learned helplessness, where people kind of just try and not do anything different, but just kind of sit there and hope things are going to get better. But, but be curious, be kind of proactive into what's happened, why has it happened? So you want to kind of investigate you know, how have I got where I've got to. Looking at the outcomes you're getting, looking at the process you've been applying, thinking about you know what's changed. You know, if my outcomes have suddenly changed, uh, is my drawdown also, is it in line with what's normal, what I've had in the past, or has it gone outside of my norm, in which case have you done something different as the market change is really key. Keeping awareness of your kind of your thinking and your feeling and emotions is really key. Recognizing that if you're moving out towards the rim, so situation, if you're kind of in drawdown and it's getting worse and you're moving out towards the rim, there comes a point when actually taking a break, not trading, refreshing your mind, doing some research and analysis is much better than being in the market. So you've got to always be thinking about, you know, what's the risk? Uh, what risk am I taking when I trade? Is there a high risk of decision making error and ill discipline? or a low risk. As that risk increases, at some point, sometimes you're better off not trading. Um, your perception is really key as well. So how do you view that drawdown? What meaning are you giving to that drawdown? It's really important. So how are you kind of viewing that? How are you explaining it to yourself? Is key in, in how you feel. But also what's important is making sure you're getting some good feelings from elsewhere. So whether it's exercise or whether it's from family life or whether it's from your friends but trying to get a good feel elsewhere so that kind of the whole world's not collapsing, which is really important. So there's a few insights there. Again, it's hard because it's a very contextual and very personal thing, but hopefully a few things that might have been useful. To learn properly how many hours do we need, good question. If you read the research, uh, and this is about kind of becoming an expert or something. Now you, you, you probably know this yourself, guys, but they talk about 10,000 hours or 10 years. Um, it's interesting because if you look at, you know, top sports people, if you look at kind of business leaders, if you look at top traders, you know, 
some of the top hedge fund traders, you know, they start off as a grad, they go into an investment bank, they become a good hedge fund trader at kind of just maybe late 20s, early 30s. They have done about 10 years. They're in the market every day, 12 hours a day for 10 years. So it is going to be thousands of hours. So it's, um, yeah, you are looking, you know, you are looking at thousands of hours. It's not going to be quick. I think, as you'd all probably know, you all seem to be quite sensible and wise traders. Um, there's no quick fixes. Uh, there's no shortcuts. I've not met any successful trader myself, really successful, consistent trader who, who did it through shortcuts. Um, it, it's really key. Um, you know, good quality training, good quality either coaching or mentoring, you know, adds massive value. So you can accelerate your learning curve. If you try and do it all yourself just from book, then that might take longer. Then if you get good quality training, and I do mean good quality training, if you get a good coach or mentor, and again, good coach or mentor, that's going to speed up your learning curve, which is really important. Also, how many hours you can spend in the market yourself. So market hours that you can get, that's going to increase or decrease your learning. Also, when you're in the market, a big accelerator of performance is evaluation. So how much you kind of focus when you're in the market and how carefully you evaluate your, your processes and your decision making. Because that's a performance accelerator. So it is going to take a long time. And you should take the long-term view on it if you really want to be successful. Um, but there are things, as I said, you know, that you can do to speed up the process. And that's what we try and do in our trading, you know, for grads and investment banks and, and for the pop group. And even in the work I do with retail traders. I'm just trying to provide a few things that can help you to get a bit of an edge to learn that little bit quicker as you go along. Okay, so one here. So not so much hesitation, but frustration when one's trading plan stops working and needs to be revised. Make an adjustment to market changes in the toughest of all challenges. Absolutely agree. It's a great point. Uh, but actually, one of the key skills of a trader, or one of the key traits of a trader, is adaptability and flexibility. So if you're going to be in the market for a number of years, 10, 15, 20 years, all the guys I work with who are seasoned pros, None of those guys are trading in the same way or the same style as they were 10, 15, 20 years ago. Some of them have changed markets two, three, four, five times. They've changed their strategies. They've changed their approaches. You've got to be flexible and kind of go with what's available. And developing that flexibility is key. And that's why when you, when you learn as a trader, we start off kind of with a what's called standardization, learning a set strategy maybe. As you become more experienced, the key kind of next step is to start to individualize your trading. Uh, and, and learn to develop your own strategy because the skill of developing strategies to fit in market conditions is a really important one if you want long, longevity. Now, it's not easy, but it is an essential skill. I mean, trading itself is not easy and trading for a long time and being successful consistently, again, is, is not easy. Um, but these are some of the factors that, come, that, that is part of the game as such. So, um, some of the best traders I know, whilst they're trading, when the markets are quieter, they're also looking at ongoing development of their strategies. They're trying things out in other markets, trying out different approaches, so that when things do change, they've already got some ideas in mind. So it's kind of sort of been one step ahead of the game, what might happen and how might I trade it if that did happen. Uh, what do you think of the modern American trading books generally full of filler? Um, like with all books, uh, and I and I and I say this as an author myself, so I don't mean with with any to discredit any people at all. But with, with, with all books vary, and you know it uh, it depends on what you want. Some people like the filler stuff in a the book; they want the stories, the examples. Other people want kind of more direct, hard hitting information or technique. So I, I I wouldn't. It'd be difficult to kind of say all American books are they like this. I mean that's a massive generalisation. I think you could say in any set of trading books. They've all got slightly different styles, perspective of the author. Um, and when you read a book sometimes, um, what you're looking for in kind of your mindset is really key. So I've read some books first time round, didn't really maybe get much from it. Read it again a year later, find it really valuable or vice versa. Or read it the third time and get something different from, it from what I've got before. So um, all books are different. You know, I think have a flick through if you can in the bookshop. Uh, read some reviews uh, and then make your own, your own informed decision. Okay, thanks there. Thanks for some of the comments there. Yeah, Tom, Tom's a good friend of mine, so it's, um, we've worked together for a long time and Tom likewise is a, is a great guy, so, so thanks for that. Um, 
it looks like that's probably the end of the questions. I know, I know we're kind of slightly over time as well, but hopefully it's been uh, been valuable for you all. Yeah, David, Paul, yeah, he's a good friend of mine as well. So it's, uh, it's a small world, the trading world. The more time you spend in it, the more you start to know all the same people, which is great. So. Okay, it pretty much looks then like we're um, we're beginning to wrap up. Thanks ever so much for tuning in. I really appreciate you giving up the time to join me. Thanks again to FX Street for inviting me to speak. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the conference in Barcelona. So if you're coming along to that, then if you do come along and introduce yourself, it'd be great to meet you. Um, when we see me next, I have no idea. That's a question for, for Maud, really, um, at FX Street and the guys there. Uh, but thanks again for joining and thanks to everybody. Thanks, Maud. And uh, it's been a real pleasure. And I'll leave it for Maud now to kind of close down and finish off. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.